welcome. We are here celebrating International Women's Day, and we are Feely, and Feely stands for tribe, and that is truly family and community. So it is my honor to welcome this panel, women who are radically resilient. I am incredibly inspired by every single woman sitting up here today, so I'd like to welcome them to the stage. Crystal Berger, media tech entrepreneur, founder and CEO of Ebo, and host of Counterculture, also a dear friend and Feely Cohort 2 member. I'd like to welcome Katya, co-founder and chief business officer at Lexit, Feely Cohort 4 member. Woo! Woo! I'd like to welcome my good friend Janice, founder and CEO of The Mentor Method and Complete Powerhouse, if you haven't met her yet. And last but not least, the fabulous Marissa, Broadway producer, lawyer, and NFT expert. I promise you this is a radically dynamic group of individuals and leaders sitting up here today, and I'm so excited to dive into their stories and their journeys. So I want this to be fun. I want this to be conversational. I have specific questions for each of you, but first, I just want to start with your story. So feel free to jump in if you're called to a question that I'm going to ask, okay? Can you tell me a little bit about your story and how it's empowered you to be radically resilient? So who wants to start with that? Janice, you want to start with that one? I want to hear you. I want to sure. hear that story, girl. Hi, everyone. My name is Janice Omadeki. I'm CEO and founder of The Mentor Method. We are a SaaS solution that helps large companies, including Amazon, Department of Education, Silicon Labs, and others, build mentorship programs at scale inside their companies without sacrificing impact. So the summarized version, eHarmony for internal corporate mentorship that shows real results. Um, my journey and what's led me to be this level of radically resilient. Um, I'm Congolese American, first generation American. My parents immigrated from the Congo in the 70s. And so growing up in a very strict religious household that emphasized the importance of education, preparedness, um, and then also my parents' willingness to be vulnerable about what they had to overcome in order to make it to America, decades of civic um, unrest, you know, the Congo's a third world nation. My mom used to have to sew her own bras to be able to go to school. Um, very, very unfortunate living situation. And for them to go from that to America, have three kids and build a better life so that I can be here talking to all of you right now. They are the embodiment of resilience. And I feel like growing up, it was just woven into the daily practice of being a part of the Omideki family. Fast forward into my corporate career, I feel like just as a woman, you have to be resilient when there are so many systems in place in the corporate ladder that are meant to have you, you know, drop several layers at any given time. It's almost like a weird game show that you'd find on ABC where it's like, which one woman is going to get promoted first? And it's very stressful. You know, I graduated in 2009, top of my class, entered into defense contracting um, as a lead graphic designer, immediately went from, you know, two for five dollar tequila sunrises in university to having a team of 15 people that some were even older than my parents. But overall, it was the old boys club. And I had to learn very, very quickly how to adapt, how to understand the systems at play to help me more than triple my salary in a five year period and become the youngest manager in the history of PwC's marketing and sales division. But I think all of that goes back to just that foundational resiliency that my parents instilled in all three of us early on. I love that. Thank you so much, Janice, for sharing that. And I love the Ask Omadeki. It could be a show. It could be a show. I want to know about your family, their core values, their Listen. culture, and they instill that resiliency in you, girl. Let's get the pricing together. Yes. We have a producer right here. Exactly. Like, I'm ready. I'm 100% ready. Exactly. I love that. Now, speaking of the fabulous Marissa Seacrest, Marissa, you have had a very untraditional path. And you have made major pivots and have become flexible as an entrepreneur. As we all know, every woman sitting up here, you must be flexible to live this life, this roller coaster journey of entrepreneurship. Tell us a little bit about your story and your personal resiliency throughout it all. So, first of all, thank you, Jacqueline. It's such a pleasure to be here and to see 
surrounded by so many amazing, incredible, inspirational women. I love that we're all here supporting one another and it, it's just an honor to be on this panel. Um, indeed, I've had a, quite a journey and faced many quote unquote obstacles in the way and those obstacles actually turned out to be opportunities, opportunities to pivot, to pivot into something that let me lean in further to my value and my mission in life. Can you all hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> that was smooth, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you. So as I was saying, um, I've had many um, obstacles, which really turned out to be opportunities, opportunities for me to pivot into something that let me lean even further into my true value and mission. And connecting value and mission, I think, is a way to stay resilient. For me, uh, my value is in supporting arts and entertainment, and the prior panel talked about this, about how you can build community and connection and have really powerful messaging through art and entertainment. So that's been a foundational value for me, and my mission has always been to support creators, and I've done that in many different ways. Uh, first, I was a professional ballerina uh, growing up and faced injury, which gave me an opportunity to reflect upon how I can better support creators long term, as opposed to having a very short lived career as a ballerina. And I decided that going to law school and becoming an entertainment lawyer would give me the tools to represent those artists in their journeys and their creative journeys. Marissa, so can you tell everyone where you went to law school? Uh, yes, I um, I chose Harvard because it had an incredible Ooh. entertainment law, law paper. <laughs> Just want to make sure we put that in there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Actually, I think the discipline of being a ballerina gave me um, mm -hmm. the stamina and the confidence to to go to Harvard and to, to be, um, you know, in an environment where people were constantly pushing themselves and um, excelling to, to the fullest extent that they could. Um, so I was very grateful to be able to work as an entertainment lawyer. Um, doing major motion picture financing. I worked on a Lord of the Rings trilogy, helped finance that, came up with um, uh, wrote my law school thesis on securitization, which is a complicated finance topic that I was able to apply to my first deal, which was a DreamWorks film securitization. So I got to do some really interesting things, but I did not feel super connected to the arts um, and to the creative process. So um, I took a leap, took a huge pay cut, moved to New York, worked to, for a small firm uh, where I got to work hand in hand with the creators and uh, met the producer of the musical Wicked, who said, you know, I need another me in the company, um, but didn't have the financial wherewithal. The show had just started out to, to hire me. So I said, well, let me work for free for three months. Um, again, turning an obstacle into an opportunity. And I was able to prove myself and work there for a decade working on dozens of shows and went out on my own um, and produced um, several shows, my last two being Waitress uh, by Sarah Bareilles. Uh, <laughs> a very empowering message story for women about, you know, uh, believing in yourself, getting out of a relationships that do not suit you in that case an abusive relationship and then having the courage and the confidence to start your own business and to follow your dreams uh, so for me finding stories that empower women are really important and then also Mean Girls uh, Tina Fey wrote the book for that so producing that on Broadway to spread the message of anti-bullying and we don't have to love everybody but we need to support one another and don't break people down to build yourself up that's not the right thing to do um so really focusing on on stories like that so um you know that was that was a pivot and then probably the biggest obstacle was covid uh because both of my shows that i was co-producing closed uh and mean girls is no longer on broadway we're on tour now but it was a real opportunity to think about well how can i pivot into something where i can take my skill sets and really amplify that and going into the digital space and having something that's 24 seven that can reach global audiences was a way for me to to think about using the producing storytelling, um, you know, the creator mindset to to contribute in that realm. So that's that's the pivot that I've taken now. So that obstacle of COVID and and my live show shutting down opened a new door for me into a world that I think is incredibly exciting to storytell. I love that. And we're going to touch base more on that 
as as we come throughout this conversation. But I want to mention a unique thread that you know is a great statistic in entrepreneurship that oftentimes athletes make fantastic entrepreneurs. It's about teamwork, it's about resiliency, and it's about pulling down deep and conquering your fears. So speaking of professional athletes, Katya, I'd love for you to tell a little bit about your story and also your personal resiliency throughout it all. Hello everybody, my name is Katya uh, Zaitsev and I'm the co-founder of Lexit. Um, amazing panel, Jacqueline. And I feel like you're my spirit animal, Marissa. <laughs> Listening to you speak about obstacles, failures, and opportunity, I look at it the exact same way. And ballet, that was part of my life, my whole life. Um, and speaking of resiliency and who you are today, I would not be the woman I am today without rhythmic gymnastics. I was put in into rhythmic gymnastics at five years old. It was five years old, not knowing. My mom just wanted me. I was <laughs> not bending properly. So she was. She just put me in the sport to see, you know, let's just get your posture a little bit better, right? <laughs> and uh, I ended up, you know, excelling pretty quickly. And uh, very quickly after a couple of years, I ended up training eight hours a day, representing Canada all over the world, uh, being national champion, and uh, you know, training in Eastern Europe for five months out of the year, and going to Pan American Games, World Championships for until I was 16 years old. So at a young age, discipline, hard work, teamwork, and c courage, and time management, everything. Everything that I adapt to my everyday life uh, is because of that. And I would have to thank my parents for that, for sure. You know, they pushed me to be the woman that I am today. They raised me properly and, and saying that you do not fear to go after what you want to go after. You can be anyone that you want to be if you just put yourself forward, right? Listen to your gut, listen to your passion, and you can, you know, become whatever you would like to be. So... At a young age, I had this confidence, luckily for them, to really strive to, to become the woman I am today and to continue growing, to keep self-reflecting, to believing that I could be better uh, every day. I always knew I wanted to become an entrepreneur, right? But I was looking for the right people to, because as we know, success is, you don't, you don't become, you don't succeed alone, right? There's so much behind, uh, doors and teamwork, having the right partners, which is why I'm going to speak to you later on, <laughs> Marissa. But having the right people around you to get you to where you are um, really, really does you know help you excel. But yes, that that is my background. That is how I, you know, met my co-founder and made decisions that were very risky. You know, I, for sure, turning point was COVID, right? But I knew I wasn't going to sit around for a couple years and thinking, you know, waiting for this to be done, right? I knew I'm like, okay, let's use this two years to work. Let's hustle, right? And I'll never forget the day when I reconnected with my co-founder and we started up Lexit, which is, you know, NFT marketplace. And, and uh, we were having Zoom calls and I said, this is inefficient. As soon as a kind of little bit of regulations uh, lifted, I, I booked a one-way ticket to Europe. And since then, we've been traveling around the world and building this platform. So I would have to thank for sure, uh, you know, my parents and, you know, being coming from an athletic background. And I would do the same thing if when I have kids, I would for sure put them in, uh, you know, certain sport. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Katya, for telling your story. And now... I save my true soul sister here, Crystal Berger, who has an incredible story. And I just want to say this woman really motivates and inspires our entire community. She is an icon cohort member for Feely. So one of our OGs, OG entrepreneurs through our program and just watching her transformation and her journey inspires me every single day. So, Crystal, I'd love to hear your story of resiliency and have you share it with everybody here and everyone tuning in virtually. 
Now, Jacqueline knows us Capricorns, we're hard on the outside and all mushy <laughs> on the inside. So, I'm, I'm, you know, I really appreciate you, Jackson, and everything. I mean, I think I hear from everybody here the make it work scenario. But for me, that is just what my life has been. You know, I grew up in West Baltimore, you know, very rough community. Um, it was a thing where we had to make it work. My mother didn't plan on being a single parent. She married my dad. They divorced when I was eight. And she just had to make it work. So she worked 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. every single day. So my brother and I were latchkey kids from the time I was eight years old. And it was a thing where we just had to make it work. You figure it out. You do what you need to do. And there are no excuses. And I think that that's something women who are resilient, that's what we do. We make it work, right? If something isn't working, you make it work. And so I have lived that my entire life. Um, mm -hmm. The women who inspire me, my, my grandmothers, they lived through the Great Depression. They lived through the Jim Crow South. They lived through segregation and integration. And here we are today where we're sitting in this room together, women of all nationalities and all ethnicities. And so my story has always been that. Like you get in there, you get it done, and you make it work. And so working in, I work, I truly had the non-traditional path of getting into network news. Um, I talked my way into a national network. I was at Fox News for 10 years as a senior booking producer. I also had a national news feature that aired on 1,300 stations nationwide. And it was because I knew I came there for a reason and I wanted to make it work. And I was responsible for bringing in 85% of the diversity into that newsroom. One of my dearest friends and mentors, she's a political analyst. She's in the room today, uh, Jamu Green. She's worked for Fox News as a correspondent and just making it work. And so those kinds of alliances, those kinds of stories of, you know, did my brother and I know that we would have to iron our clothes for school every day, cook our dinner, and you know, then put ourselves to bed. And by the time my mom got home, she would go through our homework. And when we woke up in the morning early before we went to school, we had to make sure that everything was right, right? But we made it work. And so I just believe that my story is just such a unique story, even in creating my tech company, Ebo, it's all about making and breaking those barriers to entry in whatever space that you're in. Ebo is specifically created to open up the door for women, for black women, for brown women, for white women, every woman to have a voice in the media landscape. And I created that because I wanted it to work when I was no longer in the room. And so, I mean, I could go on and on and on about <laughs> my West Baltimore story. Talk to me afterwards. I would love to share it. Um, but just know that if you're in this room and something isn't working, just sit with yourself and say, how can I make it work? Because I'm going to tell you, I am probably the most non-traditional tech founder. Mm -hmm. I am the most non-traditional black woman to be at Fox News as a senior booking producer and also a national features host. But I did it. I made it work. And so uh, my story is layered in that. And so I'm sure we'll get into more. We're going to get T-shirts that say make, make it work. work. Yeah. I feel like we need to have this. This needs to be a new feely swag right now. So I, I'm going to ask this next question, but before I do and open it up to each one of you here, you know, oftentimes as female founders and entrepreneurs, we try to do things like men, but we shouldn't. We don't have to be hard. We don't have to be tough. We can be emotional. We can be feminine. We can be soft. We can be compassionate and we can still lead with healthy boundaries and make it work and get stuff done. So my question is, how do you leverage being a woman to support your success? Oh, well, I'll start. I have do to. Do it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like having the freedom to show up in a lime green suit and some leopard pumps. Like, I think that that is the beauty of being a woman, right? And that's something that people are attracted to. I don't think that we should ever dumb that down. I think that those are the conversation starters. Those are the things that make people intrigued by your experience and your spirit. And so I think that femininity that we possess is just so beautiful, whether it's that nurturing, calm spirit that you have, or if it's that tigeress, you know, spirit that you possess own that like walk into the room knowing that your femininity is the thing that distinguishes you from the lead from the followers right like what's that steve jobs quote right uh innovation distinguishes the leaders from the followers right yep. so innovate your spirit with your femininity right walk into those rooms and own those rooms and know that that is your power that is not your inhibitor right a lot of people used to say well crystal how do you do it as a black woman at fox news i was like listen the fact that i'm black and a woman and i'm at fox news that is the that is the thing that's starts every conversation and I own that and I let that be the thing that really helped me embody my power and so I think that we have this feminine spirit that just really allows us to go into these spaces and be unique and stand out and do it so much different and so much better than men. 
I love Snaps that. Snaps for that. I love that. Um, and I totally agree. Be yourself. That's what I would say. I think do not be ashamed of who you are. You know, whether you are feminine and what, or if you're not, right? Because I know for me, when I look back, I'm like, the times when I was doubting myself or the way I looked, am I going to look too sexy or am I not sexy enough or whatnot? Screw that. <laughs> you know, just forget that. Be yourself. Be who you are who, and embrace that. Embrace that skill set and that energy will follow. And I think everyone in the room will own it. And that is, that's what I would do. I always go with my gut. The second I do not listen to my gut, I know that it's, I've made some sort of mistake. So for me is... Be you, be who you are, do not be ashamed who you are, you know, dress how you want to dress in a lime green, a green suit or not, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter because you are who you are and you are in that room for a reason. So that's how what I would say. The systems that tell women that they're less than were built so that we stay out of those rooms, make less money and have less power. When I enter into spaces as a woman, right? You hear this squeaky little voice, it's genetic, I can't help it, right? <laughs> but as a CEO and founder of a growing tech company, being one of the first 100 black women to raise over a million dollars or more in institutional funding in U.S. history. Can we I'm clap for that? Can we <laughs> just take a moment to Thank acknowledge you. that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I like to use all of this almost as a Trojan horse for those that are so absorbed into oppressive systems that are meant for me to not be in those spaces, to not even recognize when I get into the room. I'm like, surprise, I'm powerful, I have blood in my mouth, I'm ready to win and take over everything. Give me your cash. <laughs> and it works because I think especially as women, we're used to having to be beyond prepared compared to our peers. Like when we were fundraising, for what ended up being 1.6 million, we have investors including Draper Associates, Google, Capital Factory, and others. But the amount of preparedness that my team and I had to have to raise what was supposed to be a million was above and beyond. I mean, we had metrics at like the Series B level, which we shouldn't have to have. You know, I know companies that are run by um, our overrepresented counterparts that had. <laughs> can you tell that? AKA I was a white men, I'm sorry. Yeah. We can say that. <laughs> um, but, you know, we had peers that were pre revenue and just an idea that were getting, you know, millions and millions of dollars in funding. And what I would say is my intuition has been the best superpower I could have had. It has helped us make sure that we don't have the wrong people on our cap table. We're selling to the right people. We have the right team members, the right strategic partners who you know you can trust and have as a friend in addition to, you know, conquering the world together like Jacqueline and I have a lot of plans to do. And the moments, like you were saying, the moments that I didn't listen to that, regret it every single time. So I think we were given that gift of divine intuition for a reason so that when we are in spaces that feel threatening or non-equitable for us, we can navigate those like water going over rocks to get to exactly where we need to be. Uh, I would just say I am usually or quite often one of the only women in the room. Broadway is heavily male dominated and I'm finding the crypto NFT Web3 world to be even more male dominated, but I will say uh, having a female perspective and the way that I approach problem solving, the way that I come up with solutions and um, the stories I want to tell are, are very different because I am a woman and oftentimes um, very positive and having having different viewpoints, having diversity really enables you to reach a whole nother level. So I, I think it's um, it's helpful. It's helpful. Thank you. Thank you all. Now, I'm, we're gonna have a panel specifically on fundraising with a few badass women who are here for it to talk about it. But I do wanna bring this up. Raising capital as women, it's really challenging. Yeah. As non-white women, extra challenging. We are told no over and over and over again. I wanna know how each of you handle the word no, because that takes a whole nother level of resiliency on the journey. So feel free to jump in, whoever wants to answer that. I love the word no. <laughs> Personally, I do. It means that you're closer to a yes. Or, you know, the worst is when you have a maybe, personally. 
right? Because you're more in the limbo and you're dealing with undecisive people. But when you have a no, that's okay. That, that personally for me, that is more of a challenge, right? And makes me go and prepare something to really try to convince them why not? Why not? Right? But, you know, to be in that table raising capital or whatnot or receiving a no in any kind of situation, you know, it's need to go back to the drawing board and really understand what the, you know, problem is or how we could turn that no into a yes. Raising capital wise, I think having the right team around you. Yes, it's maybe more difficult for women, but you could also use it as leverage, right? And, but I think having the right team around you, the right advisors, partners, et cetera, to really prepare for yourself for the next step is, is what I do personally. I always see no's as blessings usually. So if it's no to a deal or something, more often than not, it ends up protecting me from energy that I shouldn't have been spending in something or hiring the wrong person or um, not aligning to the direction that the mentor method is taking and my career is taking. I also like to pair no's with why. Mm -hmm. So if somebody says no, like we're not going to move forward or whatever the no is, I like to say, okay, but why? Like, what is it? And when you turn it back on the other person to give you a reason, sometimes there's a lot of really good feedback. Mm -hmm. Like maybe you're not using the right terminology. Like sometimes those no's are actually about you. And it's good to ask why so that you can continue improving and pivot those no's into absolute yes, here's my, you know, write whatever number you need in my checkbook, cash it, we're good type of energy. I also treat no's... Um, sometimes as opportunities to just absorb. And sometimes they're also not about you. So for example, last Friday, we had a meeting with a potential investor slash strategic partner. I'm leaving their name. Nobody ask me. I will never tell you. <laughs> but, um, you know, this was like our fourth or fifth meeting with them. And it was time for them to make a decision mutually. Because I believe that when you're sharing a portion of your company via equity, it needs to be a mutual decision the same way any important relationship should be. We really do need to have this fundraising panel, by the way. It's but, coming up next, 3 oh, p.m. I, have, I cannot wait to listen in. But they ended up saying, top of the meeting, so Janice, we're not going to move forward because we find that black owned businesses typically give away too much of their equity up front. And we usually want to take 20 percent of a round. So we're going to pass. And my response was, well, that seems silly since you've never even looked at my cap table. Like, how do you even know that? That's not true. First of all, and you didn't do the due diligence. You just made blind assumptions based on negative pattern matching. So can you help me understand why you haven't changed the systems and your metrics for reviewing things? Because I can guarantee you, you're missing out on billions of dollars. I mean, black women are invincible. Speaking of resiliency and being able to... I appreciate that. Um, being able to ask that why and being able to have, you could see the look in their eyes of like, oh, expletive, like we really do need to make some changes. And they tried to backpedal and we're not going to work with them. I think it's the best decision for every party involved. But um, you just get used to the no's and you learn which ones are about you that that'll help you evolve and which ones are just nonsense that you can put in a box be upset about it for like 20 minutes, put it on the shelf or a chapter in your memoir and just keep it pushing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. You know, my greatest mentor always said the word no doesn't hurt. And what you two ladies yeah. just said, that's so true. It's, it's a starting point. Yeah. It's a negotiating point. Well, I have so many questions for each one of you. I could do this all day because this is my passion. I love hearing your stories of resiliency. So I'm going to dive into that now. Crystal. In your book, Be Extraordinary, Claiming a Life of Purpose, Passion, and Prosperity, you provide many practical tips to help drive purposeful, purposeful results. Tell us what drives you and how do you help others find their passion and purpose? What drives me is really being able to um, create some level of legacy, you know, for people who look like me, who come from what I come from, because it's bigger than me. You know, I, I was a ninth grade English teacher at one point in my journey. And I remember I used to always tell them, you know, 
uh, if you don't know your why, you will always be wondering why. Like, why doesn't, why is this not working? Why does this not feel right? Why is he wrong? Or why is that partner not right? Like, when you really own your why, kind of what Janice was saying, like, you know what people are aligned with you and who are supposed to go on your journey. And I had a really dear friend of mine. He used to play for the Atlanta Falcons. He passed away. But Keon said to me one day, he said, Crystal, he said, everybody can't go on this journey. You know, everybody's not supposed to be aligned with your why because they'll stagnate your process. They'll make you question what your purpose is. And I've always known I was raised by servant leaders. I was in the rec centers. Again, my mom worked 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. I mean, 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. And so I spent so much time with mentors, you know, people who invested their time and their energy into me every single day. And I would not be here if it wasn't for those people. And so I think about that seed that was sown in me by people who truly could have cared less about this little black girl from West Baltimore, right? But they really invested in me. And so for me and helping others really get to their purpose is just to say, well, what's your why? What's that thing that you wanted to do as early as eight or nine or 15 years old? I remember watching BET Teen Summit, right? It was this show used to come on. It was hosted by Ananda Lewis. And it was the first time that I saw a girl like me. She was tall, she was skinny, she was brown. And she was interviewing everyone from Jada Pinkett to Tupac and all these amazing people. People. And I remember seeing her and saying, that's what I want to do with my life. But I didn't know how. I didn't have mentors in my community to say, this is how you become a journalist and this is how you get your own television show. But I always stayed true to that. Why? And when you do that, it comes full circle. I was at the worst point in my life. I'm talking about depressed. You know, I hear all of all of the great <laughs> inspiring stories on this stage, but I was down and out, right? I had failed out of law school. I was broke. My Jaguar had just got repossessed. And I remember laying in that bed and like in tears and I picked up my journal that I had been keeping since I was about 14 years old. And it said, I want to be like the girl on BET. And in that moment, I realized, Crystal, you got to do your why. Like law school didn't work out because you're not intelligent. It didn't work out because that wasn't your why. That wasn't attached to where you were supposed to go. And so I just want to just sum it all up in saying, you know, really tapping into what it is that drives you. Stop running from it. Stop being afraid of it. Right. Make it work. Figure it out. Make it happen. Because at the end of the day, your purpose is all about your why. And if you don't have a why, you got to sit down and say, who was I at eight years old? Who was I at 15? What things just lit my spirit up? Because that's when you can truly add value to others. And so I say in that book, you'll find a lot of gems. But the main gem is really saying, what is it that you were called to do and how can you have impact? And that's what The Extraordinary is all about. And can you just tell us who are some of your current partners who sign LOIs for EPO? <laughs> Black Women Talk Tech, um, you know, Latinas in Business, um, <laughs> Feely, <laughs> a Black Speakers Network. Um, I have so many. I partnered with HL Ventures. They've been a dynamic partner of mine. They've connected us with some major media entities and organizations that I can't disclose in this room. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's really about the why of Ebo, right? Like, we want to break barriers to entry in media, and we're going to do it. And when people see that you are committed to that why, the doors are going to open. And the ones that aren't, just remember what Keon said, those folks just aren't supposed to go. I love that. Thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's worth a clap, definitely. Now, Marissa, my next question is for you. You have had an incredibly diverse background from being a law lawyer to a Broadway producer, and now you're diving into the NFT space. How has your background prepared you to think differently in this exploding new business and sector? <laughs> Thanks, Jack. So, Actually, I think each step of my career has given me um, an insight into what makes this Web3 economy work. I first started as a ballerina, so I understand a creator mindset. I understand what it means to be vulnerable, to create work, and to put it out there. Um, my next step as an entertainment lawyer gave me the insight to understand intellectual property, what it means to um, have rights, uh, how those are dissected, how those are protected, um, and the blockchain with smart contracts, how that lives in the metadata, how that goes platform to platform, all of that is incredibly important uh, because one of the things that Web3 does is it gives uh, it's a creator economy and it gives creators perpetual royalty streams 
on their intellectual property as it's sold both in the primary market and then protected through royalty participation and smart contracts in the secondary markets. So that is incredibly helpful. And then my third career as a Broadway producer really enables me to understand storytelling, to understand community building, all of which is incredibly important to Web3. Because as you build these communities, uh, you're also able to have more flexibility and autonomy as a creator because the intermediaries become less important. Um, Web3 is going to enable you to do essentially crowdfunding and to have your um, NFT holders in your community invest in you and participate in your success as you become successful. So it's going to change the landscape. And I think by um, enabling creators to have a voice without relying on traditional intermediaries, you know, big motion picture companies, et cetera, uh, we're going to have more interesting stories. We're going to see more risk taking out there. Um, so it's all three have sort of come together um, to enable me to have a very uh, interesting and different perspective in the Web3 environment. I mean, the one thing I don't have um, is a tech background. So I've, you know, taken little micro steps to to learn about that um, and, you know, partnering with the right people and, and taking classes at MITx and about blockchain and things like that. So um, it's exciting. It's exciting. And it's, um, you know, I think there's going to be a real fluidity between our in real life IRL physical world and our digital world. And I'm very excited about this next step and, and where it can take creators and the power it can give creators. Thank you so much, Marissa. Mm -hmm. And speaking of NFTs, Katya, you co-founded Lexit and are seeing huge growth across music, sports, film, and more. Part of resiliency is also sharing milestones. Can you tell us a little bit about a moment of huge success and how you celebrated it? And I also think it's worth mentioning your launch because what you've accomplished is absolutely incredible. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, yes, um, success. Well, how do you measure success? I think there's so many different ways to measure it and there's so many different types of success. Uh, whether that's finding the right people to join your team, whether that's accomplishing a milestone, it, it really depends, right? Um, my character, I feel like even if I do reach a milestone, it's never enough. <laughs> and I have to continue striving. What did I miss? What can we do better? Which is something I believe I could work on, right? But today was probably um, a bit of success. This morning, as I was <laughs> on a meeting, uh, our platform went live. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, today, uh, not the full platform, but today at lexit.com, L-E-X-I-T dot com, uh, you can create a profile. So it's, uh, it was a milestone. I'm here celebrating with you beautiful people. So I think I'm winning. <laughs> Um, but yes, I think everyone that's involved in all these milestones need to be, you know, accounted for. So, you know, if I have to give shout outs right now for this, you know, success, which is not, again, I think we're, we're not even, we just started, <laughs> right? We, we just started the cusp of it and I, I'm super excited for the next couple months and years to come. But, uh, you know, everyone that's involved from today and then going forward, that's, haven't that have been awake for 30 hours at a time that will be my product owner john wise um and ninja natalie shout out to you too and uh, of course my co-founder mira caltech and everyone else my uh my teams in kiev my tech team so shout out to you guys for really sticking it through today so thank you thank you thank you so much now janice my next question is for you your company, The Mentor Method, uses a double-blind algorithm to close the opportunity equity gap in the workplace. What are some of the biggest challenges and successes you've seen clients face in this area? Yes, so I think the biggest challenge is the great resignation, which for those of you that aren't familiar, um, last year over 22 million people quit their jobs to find either better employment, build new businesses, take some time to learn who they are, but they left. And so companies, I, our team personally calls it the great awakening, 
because the systems that were in place that were, you know, some of the cultural norms, I'm sure all of us up here had to experience of you have to be the first one in, last one out, sacrifice your family, sacrifice your mental health and well-being. We're now seeing a shift in employees and company cultures that are saying, actually, we don't have to do that. We can be whole people with lives and friends and family and balance, whatever that means for you, and also up our productivity by over 300 percent. And studies showed that throughout the pandemic. So that's been the biggest challenge. How do companies retain their talent? How do they make sure that they're optimizing for everyone's potential, regardless of where they come from, so that everybody has an opportunity to advance get promoted and help generate returns for that company's investment. Thankfully, I mean, the mentor method solves for all of that. So I would say the success there is, you know, our customers have seen increases in retention. Um, We've decreased churn, which means employees that have left. Um, They've seen 5% changes in that, that equates to about $110 million per year for some of our companies, depending on the size that they are in the revenue. And when you look at that compared to their profit margins, you know, they're seeing a lot of returns. But on a personal note, I think the biggest successes that we have are the stories we get from people that we've been able to change their lives. So for example, actually, I call her customer zero, but um, our very first end user of the mentor method is still my favorite story. And, you know, when we were talking about the bigger why, I get up every day and think about uh, the Mias of the world. She was a bar manager at TGI Fridays who was getting her graphic design certification from General Assembly, which is a technical boot camp. She had no network, no connections. She was trying to get a full-time job in um, graphic design. And so with the mentor method, oh, she was also working the front desk at a company. So with the mentor method, she signed up. One of our customers was using it. She got matched to an executive inside where she was working. In any other situation, they had been at the same company for about two years and had never had an opportunity to engage and connect. And if you looked at them on paper, you may not have necessarily said, oh, you two would get along really well. But because of our double blind algorithm that matches based on personality, values, skills and industry. And again, going back to the whole of a person and making sure that you're matched to the right individual, they got connected. And in a four month span, she went from being a bar manager. I think she was driving Lyft or Uber at the same time and working the front desk to getting a full time graphic design job with benefits. And she's been off to the races. I think she's actually on track to become a creative director for an agency now. So. For, I think the biggest success is being able to see people's lives actually change and seeing their aperture for what's possible completely blow wide open in a way that was aligned to them as per the path that was discussed previously. Absolutely incredible. So when I spoke earlier about the purpose and the importance of mentorship, you need to talk to Janice if you still need a mentor. If you need to find a mentor, seriously, this is your woman to speak to today. Happy to help. This is what we do within Feely. Now, I have two of my cohort members up here, and I have two dear friends up here. Something that we encourage in Feely, in all of our cohorts, teaching women how to ask for what they want and what they need. As women, we are conditioned not to ask for things. We are conditioned to be polite, to say please, to say thank you, and never to ask. This is our day to speak up. This is our day to use our voice and own it. So I'm going to put each one of you on the spot. Crystal and Katya are used to it. (laughs) But I'm going to put each one of you on the spot. And I want you to speak to everybody in this room and to 100,000 Soho House members globally and make your asks. How can this community support each one of you today? Crystal, I'm going to put you first. (laughs) Hey, go to joinebo.com. You can go to support and then you can donate. That's one of the main ways. Just like Janice mentioned, she talked about black female founders and, you know, not even raise 1% of black founders raise capital. And I think black women is 0.34% raise venture capital. And, you know, like 
that is the biggest barrier to entry into most of these spaces is not having the capital to sustain and grow and scale your company. You could be a dynamic founder with a dynamic idea, but if you don't have the support, then you can't get it. So what Ebo needs is we need qualified subject matter experts to join our platform. So if you are in this room and you consider yourself an expert, join Ebo, right? It's that simple. And if you know any media entities, any media organizations or companies that are looking for great automation for their subject matter bookings processes, the ask is to say introduce them to crystal my email address is crystal at expertbookingsonline.com or you can go to joinebo.com but essentially that's what it is we need partners and we need we need capital to actually sustain and grow our business so that's my ass katya i got you girl <laughs> uh, my ask would be go to lexit.com l-e-x-i-t.com and create a profile so you asked me to talk about our launch so our launch is going to be the beginning of april at nft miami week and anyone who signs up prior to that they will have very high incentives for our platform and you know, why our platform is going to be so great is that we are the only NFT marketplace that offers KYC verification, which is know your customer, right? So it's going to be very secure and safe platform anti money laundry. Also, all the NFT projects that we are working on, we're working with amazing musicians, athletes, race teams, and much more. And what we're trying to do is provide NFTs to really adapt into their business model. We work with them, we provide a white glove service and we understand their six to 12 to 24 month goals and we really dive in to really understand what they're trying to achieve and we design an NFT model for them to see how we can help engage, adapt user engagement, fan engagement, which whatever industry that they are in and we provide a whole marketing platform for them so they can, that's why we're gonna work together. Yes, <laughs> um, but it's there's going to be a lot of exciting projects that were that are going to be on our platform, and I can't wait to share it with you. So please follow our socials and create a profile because there's a lot of exciting things coming. Thank you, Janice. I did not know this was going to be a question, but I like it. I, <laughs> I know I, I like to put you <laughs> ladies on the spot. No, I like it. So, who here has had a mentor before? Just show of hands. Okay, from what I can see, good amount of you have had that. Now imagine if you didn't have a mentor, how much harder your journey and your path would be. Unfortunately, you know, 91% of professionals want a mentor, but only 30% or so actually have one. One relationship, as you've heard, all of us are here because of at least one powerful relationship that completely got us in alignment to our career paths and journeys. And in 2022, I know that we all can agree that it is absurd that anybody in a corporate environment, anybody at work, anybody trying to build a career would be excluded from an opportunity to realize their whole selves, their authentic selves at work. And that's the power of mentorship when it's done right. And that's what the mentor method does every single day for thousands of users saving millions of dollars. So what I would say to you, everyone here and everybody online, one, thank you for watching, but two, if you work at a company that's in the enterprise space, uh, management consulting, financial services, tech, um, with a thousand employees or greater, and you think that your company culture needs an evolution and can do better, bring us in. Happy to have a conversation, happy to do an audit of your cultural standing. We'll do some webinars. And in addition, you know, leverage the mentor method software, of course. So if you're interested in that, please find me, Janice, J-A-N-I-C-E, at thementormethod.com. And I look forward to helping you evolve. Thank you. And Marissa. So in the spirit of International Women's Day, I want to amplify women women's voices, women's stories in both the live space and the Web3 digital space. Uh, the first NFT I bought was a world of women. Uh, and I was attracted to that because it um, really is a strong community of empowered women. And I'm interested in working with creators who uh, are, are women or want to support women. Um, so reach out if you have a project. I work with an NFT. I'm an advisor for an NFT strategy company. I've worked with various platforms. Um, I've been in the space for a long time and I'm very passionate about it. And we need more women and the crypto NFT Web3 space. We need, we need our voices to be heard and we need to be a part of what's happening uh, in the future. So reach, I'm, I'm Marissa Verse. 
at Twitter <laughs> and Instagram, <laughs> M-A-R-I-S-A, verse. So you reach out. I want to support and help you all. Let's give a huge round of applause to these powerhouses. Thank you so much, ladies. I really appreciate each and every one of you. And truly, together, we move mountains. So thank you for being a part of this tribe, this family, and this community. You are all getting to see the power of Feely and what we do. So thank you so much.